Um, so welcome everyone joining us live on Zoom and to all those watching the recording again. You're joining the How Does Nature Connection Support Community Wellbeing event that's part of the Community Action for Wellbeing series being run by the Network of Wellbeing and Eden Project Communities. Um, we're so excited to have such a big audience with us this evening and have three incredible speakers to share on this topic and we're also really looking forward to connecting and hearing from everyone that's joining in the audience. Um, if you are a social media minded person and you'd like to tweet about this event either during or afterwards, you can use the hashtag community for wellbeing. So hashtag community for wellbeing, all, um, all one word. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's great to be able to connect with people in that way. Um, and yeah, we're just going to, before we get started, I'm, I'm going to introduce the speakers in a moment, but I just want to help us kind of arrive in this online space uh, together. So we're just going to do a really short kind of breathing exercise um, just to kind of ground us and appreciate being connected in this way this evening. So I'll invite you to just get comfortable in your seat, maybe feel your feet on the floor um, and perhaps just lower your gaze slightly from the screen. If you feel comfortable doing so, you could close your eyes, but just taking we won't, this will be no more than a minute or so, but just taking a moment to just pause. Just taking a few deep breaths. And just really feeling the importance of the topic to you this evening. So what has drawn you to this event this evening? What does nature connection mean to you? What does community well-being mean to you? just feeling any ideas that bubble up and perhaps feeling any kind of distractions that are left over from the day and just kind of inviting yourself to be present in this moment in this event and just knowing that whatever has come up for you there about what nature connection means to you what community well-being means to you know that there's over a hundred other people that have chosen to spend their evening also exploring these topics together. So we're together in this event, in this experience, even if we're not able to be physically together right now. And just feel any kind of, yeah, warmth or gratitude or appreciation for those other people that are here this evening with us to share and connect. And with a few final deep breaths, I'll invite you to open your eyes if your eyes were shut or raise your gaze back to the screen. So thank you so much for just taking a moment just to ground ourselves in um, our experience together this evening. Um, so just to find out a little bit more about uh, you guys um, before we hear from the speakers, like I mentioned, we really want this to be a really interactive event. I'm going to share a poll, um, which hopefully you'll be able to see now. Um, and yeah, the event this evening is about how does nature connection support community well-being. So the first question in this poll is, is nature easily accessible for your community? Is it very easily accessible? Partly not very accessible, not at all. Um, and also, of course, we're in this really kind of interesting and challenging context of, of COVID at the moment. So has COVID-19 actually changed your relationship to nature in any way? Um, and this, the, both of these topics in terms of access and, and the impact of COVID are topics that we're going to pick up on and hear, hear from the speakers on um, later in this event. But we just really wanted to get a sense of your guys uh, take on, on these questions. So I'll give you just one or two more seconds to share your responses to those questions. And then I'm gonna end the poll now. And then I'll share the results with you guys so you can see. So really interesting, 62% of people have very easily accessible nature in their community, which is wonderful. 35% of people partly accessible. So only very few people joining don't have very easy access to nature, which um, in a way I imagine because you guys have been inspired to come to an event about Nature Connection does make sense. Um, has COVID-19 changed your relationship to nature? 73% say yes. So 
that's really interesting and um, look forward to kind of discussing that further as the event progresses. So I'll stop sharing that poll now. So thanks so much for taking part. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our first speaker for this evening, which is uh, Juliet Rose from the Eden Project. So um, Dr. Juliet Rose is a development project uh, development manager for the Eden Project. She started life studying plants but diversified into community programs and happily mixes the two now in her work. She has worked at the Eden Project since its beginning and currently manages the Eden Communities Development Team as well as being part of the National Wildflower Centre Team. We're really happy to have Juliet with us this evening and I'll hand over to you now Juliet. Thanks Flo and hello everyone and um, just as um, Flo said how wonderful to have all these people together all interested in this in this subject it's a really um really nice to see you all um i was asked to think about nature connection um and explore with you how nature supports the well-being of people of different ages and i thought i would do that by talking about one of the projects that we have at eden which supports um intergenerational groups and in particular grandparent child carers and i was just wondering while I've got you all here, how many of you here are a grandparent and look after your grandchildren or use grandparents as part of your childcare? If you could wave, Matt, wave or don't wave at me. I don't, <laughs> there's quite a few, yeah, there's quite a few hands waving at me as I, as I flick through. So you are in a majority um, and you're a very interesting group of people, both the grandparents and the people who use their parents as child, uh, as child care. About one in three um, working parents use grandparent child care. And they are an interesting but quite invisible group until recently, as you know, during the pandemic and we all got locked down, there was this sudden moment when we all realised that we couldn't access that care um, in the way that we couldn't access our schools and the way that we couldn't access um, our nurseries and I think suddenly the grandparent childcare army got much more visibility than it normally had but anyway they're an interesting group and I'd like to explore how um, this group is a way of understanding how nature connection um, can support our community well-being so if you don't mind I'm just going to share a bit of a screen hopefully can you see that Oh, it's doing it again. My computer is having, bear with me one second. Bear with me. It's chosen this evening to have. Right, there we go. Can we all see that? How's that looking? Yeah, that's better. So I think um, it, what I'm going to talk about really is about this powerful connection between nature connection and intergenerational interaction and how that creates benefits for our younger and older members of our community. So for me, um, I don't know about, I, I had a little bit of a think about um, how you define well-being and I think sometimes well-being means lots of different things for different people. But for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about, I've used the um, New Economics Foundation five ways to well-being, which I know is quite old now, but I, I quite like it because it's a really kind of simple way of of understanding the different benefits um, of well-being, and so I'm using this connect, be active, take notice, keep learning and give as a way of talking about what I mean by well-being. And as I said, I'm going to use our program at Eden called Deep Roots New Shoots, which is a nature-based Eden project supporting grandparent child carers to explore some of these things. So um, bear with me. Now, as I said, grandparents are a really interesting group of people. If you're looked after, by your grandchild, um, sorry, if, you're, if your grandchild looked after by, by your grandparent, you are, there, is a, there are a few kind of nuances to, to what happens to the care, but research, research has shown that you are more likely um, perhaps to spend less time with other children because being a child carer is quite isolating. And actually there are very few groups that support grandparents. So it's very hard for them to get out, meet other grandparents and for the children to play with other children you're also more likely to weigh a bit more if you're a child because grandparents are really quite treaty. I find that it's quite good not to ask what the grandchildren have been eating that day, but it certainly makes the children very happy. Um, and <clears throat> possibly because the grandparents, some grandparents can um, 
feel very nervous about taking their children out. We get lots of interesting testimony from some of the grandparents we work with that said they feel much more responsible from their grand, for their grandchildren and much more worried about taking them out than they ever did with their own children. And that may be because they have not had a chance to do it for such a long time, but um, they seem to be more worried about them falling down a hole than they were ever worried about their own children falling down a hole. Um, and um, for, some, for some grandparents, there's also maybe some kind of physical or physicality issues where they're maybe not as fit as they once were and they worry about um, kind of the toll it's going to take on them for being outside for too long. So, um, but there is something that grandparents really absolutely excel at, and that is language development. They are amazing at developing conversational skills and establishing the vocabularies of children. And given that language development is the foundation of all learning, this is an extraordinary um, skill of grandparents that we probably should be making more of. The other thing that we've also found that they are brilliant at is that grandparents are amazing at playing in nature. They absolutely know what to do. And I don't know whether that's because that's how they played as a child, but certainly when we've seen grandparents playing in nature with their grandchildren and parents playing in nature with their children, the grandparents nail it every time. They completely understand what to do. They don't need much prompting um, and, and they just go for it. So we, um, at Eden, we've always kind of believed that playing is for life, not just for childhood. Um, and we've developed this program that uses facilitated walking trails, science activities, art, music, to support child development and connect grandparents with each other and with their children and with nature. And if you want to find more out about the project, I'm not going to go into the nuances of the activities, but there's loads of information on our site. We've moved, um, we've created a whole load of an online activities um, while we've all been in lockdown that you can access via our Eden community sites. And we can share that link with you later if you want to have a look at those. So we know that nature is an extraordinary playground and, a, and an amazing classroom. And actually, when you combine this with the skills of the grandparents, particularly around language development, you get some really, really amazing things happening. Because nature is such an extraordinary um, and dynamic environment, because things are always changing, because it's so sensory, because there are lots of there's lots of diversity all around you. It just generates words and words and words and topics of conversations. And so when you combine that with the skills of the grandparent, you get an extraordinary thing, particularly around learning and development for young children. The other thing that we can talk about is this thought, this idea of taking notice through nature. So I don't know if you've ever, for those of you who have spent, um, spent time with young children in nature, you'll know that it's a bit like spending time on an alien planet. Everything is, what's this? What's this? What's this? Wow, wow, wow. And you're kind of looking again, well, it's a snail, you know, what is it? And of course it's for them, um, but they've got a point. And the point is that they are able to see the extraordinary and the ordinary. And the wonderful thing about that for adults, for all adults, not just grandparents, is that it forces you to, um, to really live in that moment. But it also at some point, in some way, helps you restore your sense of wonder and your connection to nature. So again, there's this, what nature does is release the capacities of grandparents to be the most amazing um, teachers and developers, but it also, the, the children release the capacity of nature for us to be in that moment and to really take notice of what's around us. The other thing we've found is that nature um, and, intergener and, and intergenerational activity are brilliant for encouraging people to be more active. You can spend loads of time in nature um, being really active, playing with children and, you know, doing incredible physical activity without even realising how long you've spent and what you've done. Um, particularly beneficial if you're if you're particularly beneficial if you're nervous or if you are um, finding it difficult to get out very often. And the other thing we found is that nature encourages people to connect with each other. A lot of our activities we've tried really hard to create shared activities that bring people together. But nature naturally brings people together. And again, it's this sense of this changing environment, this moving systems the way in which you can respond to each other and changes in time and season that gives people things to talk about, shared experiences 
um, memorable um, activities. So I whiz through this. So um, in short, really, nature for me supports well-being for lots of intergenerational, intergenerational groups by providing opportunities to play, learn and develop, particularly around language development, to take notice and live in the moment, particularly when you're combining the experiences of the young and the old, to be active and connect with others, particularly if we remove barriers and shared activities. By removing barriers, we found that um, providing a series of structured and unstructured activities to allow people to access nature by just being sometimes another pair of hands and eyes um, when we're running our activities, especially if grandparents are coming on their own with their grandchildren and making people feel safe. Particularly, I think if you're the sole grandparent, the sole um, child carer and you're out and about, sometimes um, you, it's really helpful to have people holding you in that space while you're connecting to nature. Um, it also allows you um, to, to, to connect, particularly when you have shared activities. And the problem at the moment is with the pandemic is we're not allowed to share anything. But that act of sharing also makes you, feel, makes you feel safe and encourages you to take part in those activities. But if you want to know more about this programme and what we've done, um, there is a, a summary report that was on our website called Wondering Aloud. Um, and I would urge you to have a read of that and get in contact with us if you'd like any more information. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet, for sharing. Um, it's really inspiring to hear. Um, yeah, round of a, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> um, it's hard to give a round of applause on Zoom, but there is a reactions button if you want to give a, uh, <laughs> or, or of course. But um, yeah, I think the points that you make about playing not being is for life, not just for childhood is really powerful and so important. And I think um, a lot of the lessons that have been learned from that particular piece of work you've done at Eden Project are likely relevant across um, different groups. And maybe we I noticed that was raised in the chat and maybe we can kind of come to that in the Q&A section. Um, and just to let people know um, that are joining us live, you feel free to share questions that you've got for Julia and our other speakers in the chat box. My colleague Roger is keeping a close eye. It can help if you've got a question that you really want to be asked to write question, even in capital letters, if you're um, just to help Roger kind of pick them out because we're quite a big uh, group this evening. Um, but yeah, feel free to share your questions and we will come to those later. And also just to say we're really focusing on access to nature for different groups this evening. So there Juliet's talked um, about grandparents and children and children generally um, what, what we can learn from, from those types of projects. And now we're going to move on to our um, next speaker, um, Maxwell Iamba, who is um, going to look at a completely different angle of nature access. So Maxwell is an environmental journalist by profession and protects, uh, project coordinator at Sheffield Environmental Movement. And he is co-founder of Black Men Walking, which is a really interesting project he's going to tell us more about, and a PhD research student at the University of Nottingham. His research interests include reconnecting people from BME communities to the natural environment for health and well-being. So really look forward to hearing what Maxwell's got to share. And I will hand over to Maxwell. And also I know Tracy's going to help with sharing Maxwell's slides when you're ready, Maxwell. Oh, I think you're still muted, Maxwell. I'll just um... Can you see Maxwell's screen slides? Yep. Yeah. You're yes. on. Um, Please don't jog me. Please don't jog me. Oh, sorry, that was someone else other than Maxwell. Maxwell, I just need, to, you just need to unmute your microphone and then I've unmuted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. And thanks for everyone for joining us uh, this evening um, for this very important uh, uh, event. Um, I, would like to, I would like to kick off my, um, my uh, well, talk this evening by referring back to the survey that, you flew, that Flo has just uh, conducted. 62% um, of you, of participants this evening, said they had access to green space. 35% uh, said partly. Just only 2% said they didn't. This is just an indicator of how green space is, the green space narrative, to me, is a narrative of privilege. 
um, you know, as the survey has already portrayed. Um, and you all agree with me that um, with COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it has touched every part of our society, economy, <laughs> environment, and our social connections. And, and you also agree with me that um, the role of uh, green space in physical fit and mentally well has come to us. Um, and so how often we visit green space, like parks, is a barometer of our confidence and, uh, and, and in terms of access as well. So what I want to be talking to you this evening about is about um, the work I've been doing um, at Sheffield Black, uh, uh, sorry, at uh, SIM, Sheffield Environmental Movement, uh, to promote access and participation in natural, in natural green space for people from Black and ethnic minority communities. Um, going back to the survey again, which I just conducted, you find out that already, um, what do you call it, um, uh, a survey was done uh, by um, uh, what you call Natural England. Uh, who said one well, eight of homes in England has no garden, with the figure much higher among black, black families than white. And data from National England again cons consistently show that people living in more disadvantaged areas, people from BME communities and people with disabilities or long-term health conditions, visit parks and green spaces less frequently. So again, it just goes to tell us that green space is, is um, a sample of privilege. And, this, and we all know there's a strong correlation between these groups and people who are less physically active. So obviously, we don't have BME people really struggle to access green spaces. So the pandemic, to me, has both highlighted and exacerbated this inequity in terms of access to green space. So what do we do at SIM, uh, Chef Environmental Movement? Can you move to the next slide, um, please? Um, so basically, um, we work here to reconnect BME people to natural environment uh, in terms of providing practical activities, which um, ranges from you know um, uh, foraging, course fishing, you know um, uh, environmental photography, at, uh, you know environmental portrait, all those things that will enable people to really connect to green spaces. Of course, it's one thing just taking people out. The other thing is giving them something to do, to feel part of that space, that sense of belonging. So basically what we do at uh, Chef Environmental Movement is to promote the opportunity for BME people to reconnect to the British landscape or green space by giving them that sense of confidence and fulfillment at the space. So by so doing, we enable dialogue by helping to identify the barriers that will help facilitate BME communities and environmental organizations to experience the benefits of access in nature. Um, the pro why we do this is because basically the groups we work with, because they have been historically marginalized from the environment, the whole green space, um, what do you call it, um, uh, field, um, they lack that, you know, um, that opportunity and confidence to be involved in, in green space. And so if you look at the whole green space management, you find all they are all white, and so people don't see their own kinds there. So what we are trying to do is try to change that narrative and to make it more inclusive. So we did that. We, so basically what we do is capture and diffuse knowledge about the UK environment to group to BME community groups who are interested to, to participate. Can you move to the next slide, please? So basically, if you look at these two pictures here, you see on the left, I was at um, Longshore Estate and Moreland Discovery Center where we have the working group, which I'm going to be talking about soon, which is now called the Work for Health, which we work first Saturday of every month. Um, you know, whether rain, sun, or snow, whatever, we just walk. And then the right hand side is um, the Windrush group, uh, African Caribbean elder women who I take walk, I take our walking every time. Uh, I've taken them also to the Carrigate Agricultural Shore. You know, have something they've never been. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, um, so basically, I, we do we do arrange all kinds of walks, and um, you know, uh, the Black Men Walking Group is, is one of our flagships, um, which obviously you might have heard about um, Black Men Walking, uh, which became a national play uh, that toured England uh, national theatres by um, Eclipse and Royal Theatre production in 2018 and 2019, and that play was a hit, and people just wanted to find why Black men are walking because um, you know why Black men walking. Uh, which again makes me think about that uh, uh, Shelton, Ron Shelton's play about a uh, white man can jump, uh, you know, because why are black men walking landscapes uh, in the countryside? But basically, you know, um, walking 
it's fundamental and foundational for every human being to reconnect to, to nature. And so basically black men walking is so important for our mental, mental well-being and physical well-being. And because especially with BME community groups, we do have a whole lot of health issues as the pandemic has exposed to the lack of green spaces. So the walking is so important in promoting you know, people's well-being and confidence. And that's why we do really um, at, uh, at, um, at, at my organization to encourage all BME community groups to be able to have access to green spaces for health and well-being and also to be involved in you know, environmental citizenship, really. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? Right. So I spoke about the Black Men Walking One, which obviously um, started in 2004, uh, which created, you know, created space for Black men to walk and talk, um, you know, um, you know, have a freedom to, to space for, you know, to uh, what do you call it, uh, socialize or interact with, you know, people like themselves. Um, but then uh, we then moved on from, you know, changed the name from Black Men Walking to Walk for Help. Uh, as the work now involve a lot of um, you know women and young people who join the group, so you know the Black Men Working Group has actually um, pioneered uh, access to countries that green spaces for for Black people, and now we have a number of groups that we are promoting to get working and keep working as well. Yeah, next one, please. Right. So if you look at left. Um, this Southeast Asian women and um, both women, men, and young people. Uh, this was taken recently at the Moreland Discovery Center, where we take them out. They don't want to go out on their own. They want to go out in groups because of fear of racism or fear of, you know, the unknown. Um, so basically, just having some coming out in groups and having someone with them and talking to them about the ecology, the history of the landscape. Um, then they get so excited and so interested, like um, you know, you find a uh, rhododendron, which is a plant that is grown here. Um, they they liken that plant back in Pakistan because it's a native species. And so when they see plants that come from different parts of where they come from, then they get so excited, um, and they want to learn more. And so it's in a way of trying to reconnect them to 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 the, the landscape or green spaces in, in in the UK, and they get so excited, and they want to learn more and want to know more. Next slide, please. Right. So basically, having worked, you know, for a number of years in this field, um, we came to understand, you know, um, you know, that um, there are a whole lot of issues that act as barriers for BME people to get involved. Um, besides the fact that, you know, if you look at the whole environmental field, it's um, completely white, um, you know, um, you know, and, and steeped in, uh, you know, in eugenics and all kinds of stuff. And so you don't find BME people in, in, in you know, in environmental uh, sector. Um, and so their lack of awareness of what goes, what environmental organizations are, what they do, um, and, and, and those kind of issues. So it's a question of we working to engage them and introduce most environmental organizations for them to know um, and what they do and how they can get involved. Uh, and then we also realize some environmental organizations, some of their staff lack that cultural sensitive knowledge about BME community groups, which are quite, uh, you know, they are not homogeneous. Um, and so basically, you should know how you work with all BME groups uh, in a different way to connect them and engage with them. Um, and then going back to role models, like a role models within the environmental sector and organizations have said, um, you know, you find out that it's quite a niche area, only white. Uh, and so we try to, to, to change that narrative. And by changing that narrative, the only way we can do is to, to, to empower people and give them opportunity and exposure to, to, to green spaces and to reconnect with environmental organizations out there for them to understand and work with them. So that's what we do. We act as a broker between BME community groups and environmental organizations to promote inclusion and diversity. Okay. Move on, next slide, please. So basically, again, just tells you about the groups that we take our work in from diverse groups um, and they all have fun, they enjoy it, they enjoy countryside, uh, they love it. Um, you know, if someone tells you they don't love it, that's a lie, they love it. Uh, but again, like I said, green space is a question of privilege. Uh, if you don't have the right outdoor gear or kit, you can't go out there. If you don't know where you are going, you, you don't go there. Um, you know, if you don't know what you're going to be doing out there, you don't go out there. So there's a whole lot of things that people who are privileged take for granted when it talk to, come to connecting to green spaces. And that is the, that's the issue we are trying to address. 
So we work with environmental organizations to help address those issues. Can you move on next slide, please? One minute to go, Maxwell. Yeah. So basically, just to conclude, yeah. So if I'm not able to see myself in that particular space through having the opportunity to view people like myself, you know, uh, taking part or talking about various activities and growing from that experience, I'm more likely to be more proactive and want to replicate that experience. That's a quote that I've put up. Um, and then I've quoted these two there. You can see we might all be equal, you know, um, in the starting line, right? Um, uh, but political, economic, and cultural resources that people have and the hurdles that they have climb and to get there are inherently unequal. And that's quote from Sports and Leisure uh, Javi in 1991. And then the final quote is there might be those who unintentionally discriminate mainly because they fail to acknowledge how racial inequality, cultural variance, and their own organizational behavior restrict equal opportunities. And that was also a quote taken from Black and Ethnic Minorities and Sports Policy and Objective Sports Council in 1994. These quotes have been very long, but nothing has changed so far. And that's exactly what we are trying to do at SIM. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxwell. That's really uh, powerful to hear about the amazing range of work you're doing. And uh, I can see from comments from people in the chat box, it's really appreciating. So um, yeah, everyone uh, feel free to show your appreciation to Maxwell in a round of applause, either with a reaction or a actual round of applause. Um, thank you again. Um, and if people have questions that they'd like to share with Maxwell, do um, put those in the chat box and um, with the word question in front of them. And then my colleague Roger is going to be keeping an eye out for those questions as they come in so we can put them to the speakers at the end. Um, so we've, yeah, really interesting to hear just a little reminder to everyone to mute if you're not talking and um, just so that we don't get any background noise. Um, but really interesting to hear um, both Julia and Maxwell's um, experiences and perspectives on access to nature for, for different groups of people. Um, we're now going to hand over to um, Craig Bennett um, from the Wildlife Trust to give us um, a presentation for, or in, in a sense of kind of the wider picture from the UK of kind of access to nature. Um, so Craig is uh, started as the chief executive of the Wildlife Trust in April 2020, with the ambition of putting a third of the UK's land and sea into nature recovery by 2030. And Craig was previously CEO of Friends of the Earth, where he refocused the organisation on its unique role of empowering communities to take action to tackle the climate and ecological crisis. And he's been described as one of the country's um, top environmental campaigners. So really great to hear from Craig this evening um, on this topic. So I'll hand over to you now, Craig. Good evening, Flo, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for that. And I have to say, I'm delighted to be speaking at this event tonight and delighted to be on the panel with Juliet and Maxwell as well. Uh, not least because I think Juliet and Maxwell have made my job a bit easier by giving those statistics and the sort of background uh, to actually why uh, the nature connection matters so much for community well-being. So as Flo said, what I want to do is go really big picture and ask sort of more rhetorical questions, almost philosophical questions about why it is from a, in terms of our politics and our policy, we're not getting the cuts on this that we really should do and actually how there's opportunities to do that, I hope, in the future. Uh, I want to talk quickly about three things. One, the, the essential requirement for everyday access to nature. Secondly, the urgent need for a natural health service. And third, just how critical natural learning is for everyone, but of course, particularly uh, young people and children. So first of all, to go into everyday access for nature, I'll kick off with a bit of an introduction to the Wildlife Trust, because you might think you know the Wildlife Trust, but actually uh, I thought I knew it. And then I started in this job in April and uh, some of the statistics and just work of the Wildlife Trust has blown me away. Um, we are 40, a group, a federation of 46 individual wildlife trusts across England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland and the Isle of Man, uh, the Isles of Scilly and Alderney as well. Uh, at each area working very closely with the local community and part of the local community to put nature into recovery. But we really started through that model of uh, creating nature reserves, of identifying the very best bits of nature that were left and trying to protect them. 
and we started over 100 years ago in doing that and have grown to the scale we are now with our 850,000 supporters in total right across the UK. If I tell you that we've now got more nature reserves uh, than McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK, that's a statistic I rather like, particularly when I tell you that it's not just a little bit more, it's a thousand more. We've got a thousand more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK. And the reason I like that statistic, but the reason it also should give us pause for thought, is everyone knows where their local McDonald's is, for better or worse, and whether they admit it or not, we all know where the local McDonald's is. But not everyone knows where their local wildlife trust reserve is, or indeed a nature reserve managed by anyone else, by the local authority or by another nature organisation. In fact, what's been really fascinating is during lockdown, even supporters, long-term supporters of the Wildlife Trust have gone off and discovered nature reserves run by us in their locality that they didn't know existed. The other thing about our nature reserves is we estimate that 60% of the British population live within a three mile walk of or cycle of our nature reserves. So we are very much about that local nature. But this is where we and the whole movement and society has to get so much better. Because I was really struck by, in that weekend before lockdown began, if you remember, there was those uh, news stories in the media about how, because it was the last weekend before lockdown, hundreds of thousands of people charged across the country to go up Snowdon for the weekend. And let's face it, that's unsustainable, even if you're not in lockdown or even you're not in a COVID situation. I think perhaps the environmental movement for too long have inadvertently framed nature as something that's distant and sometimes even foreign on the other side of the country. Or we've talked about the most special places or the honeypot places. And that's why you then see so many people crowding to these places uh, when they suddenly want to reach out. What we've all got to do a much better job of doing is connecting people to nature close to where they live, because we know it's so critically important for well-being in just the way that Julia and Maxwell have been talking about. But also, we know that we haven't got nearly enough nature. So actually, we know that those nature reserves that we as the Wildlife Trust, our sites of special scientific interest, what, nature reserves run by the RSPB or whatever, actually those will wither away unless we can join them up, unless we can make more space for nature and actually have ecosystem processes working at scale again. Which is why earlier this year as the Wildlife Trust, we said we need to see around a third of our land and sea across the UK being put into nature's recovery. We need to join them up. We need to connect, protect and connect our bits of nature across the country. And we need to take those scrappy bits of land that at the moment might be good for nature, but aren't recognised as such and protect them. And we also need to make sure we can take old bits of agricultural land, which are not particularly good for agriculture, but are being used at that at the moment because of the subsidies. And we need to take those and put those into recovery for nature and let nature do what it does very well of being able to recover and actually join things up. So this is why we have proposed over the last couple of months, a new designation, a new land designation called Wild Belt, because strange enough in, a, in all our designations we have at the moment, you have our areas of outstanding natural beauty, we have our national parks, those are a uh, new designation called Wild Belt because we need, to, uh, we need to absolutely put nature and recovery close to where people live in our towns, in and around our towns and cities, connecting our towns and cities and where the most deprived, the most poorest communities in the country live right back out into the countryside and make sure that they can be part of nature's recovery. And our vision is that we can take uh, where we've had a vision of where in the past people have had, we've had green belt and we keep green belt. I'm not suggesting for a minute we lose green belt, but we can overlay parts of our green belt with this additional designation wild belt to actually make sure that we have nature on green belt as well, which at the certain times we don't at the moment. My vision is that actually you, as you're passing through the UK, wouldn't it be amazing if the first thing you saw as you approached our towns and cities was actually nature all around it. And because actually a lot of our nature at the moment is in a better state in our towns and cities and in the wider countryside. So we'd be starting from that foundation, but it is so crucial that everyone, no matter what their background, must have doorstep access to high quality natural places near to where they live, they grow, they work and they play. This is critically important. 
We've also spotted how important this is to people right through the pandemic. Um, if I tell you that at the Wildlife Trusts, we saw a 2000% increase in visits to our uh, webcams from our nature reserves during the pandemic uh, over the same months on the year before. So we know people want this. Uh, so we've absolutely got to focus it. I would uh, encourage the politicians to get moving on this. Boris Johnson likes to talk about project speed. I say what we need is a project speed for nature. And that's the one where we really need to get seriously urgent about putting nature into recovery. So what then about uh, the second thing I was going to talk about, a natural health service. Again, we've been hearing from uh, other speakers here about how ha healthy, happy lifestyles are absolutely essential for improving people's well-being. And critically, we need more investment in and better join up with health services on place based health and preventative approaches. The government has started pilot piloting a green prescribing for mental health pilot programme which will be running through in 2021 and through to 2023 and that we as the wildlife trusts are involved in. But we need to see this scaled up far more quickly. What I find extraordinary about this is we've just been through uh, six, seven, eight months where the, we keep talking about the phrase protect the NHS and we all believe that most strongly. But you know, we shouldn't just be protecting the NHS during pandemics. We should have been protecting the NHS for years by uh, focusing on prevention rather than cure. And we know one of the best ways to protect people's physical and mental well-being is providing them access to quality nature and encourage them to get out into nature. That also helps us tackle things like obesity. And when you put the mental health crisis and the obesity crisis together, that represents a huge amount of uh, expense that is being used in the NHS and obviously a, a huge amount of um, uh, pain really that for society that would be so much better to prevent. It's also worth saying that it was 10 years ago that um, uh, Sir John Marmot did his first review about looking at uh, access to uh, the, the environment and nature and well-being and 10 years on from that uh, there's been another report recently over the last year and I will send out a, a link to it um, on Twitter as we go through this uh, that indicates that sadly a lot of things haven't changed, that it is still the most uh, deprived communities, the poorest communities in this country that suffer the, the um, environmental risk mostly. And we shouldn't forget that climate change itself is a health issue. Too often it's not talked about as a health issue and yet we know uh, from papers in the Lancet and other studies that indicated that climate change uh, looks set to become the greatest health issue uh, this century, which I know in the middle of a pandemic sounds surprising, but actually when you look across the century, uh, we do expect that to be the case. So then what about the final point? What about natural learning? Well, at the Wildlife Trust, we have, uh, we engage with, uh, in normal years, not so much this year, but in normal years, we engage with hundreds of thousands of school children through our education programme. And uh, every Wildlife Trust has programmes around uh, working with local schools. And we found that through the hundreds of thousands of school children that engage with Wildlife Trust through our work, uh, that it's produced huge benefits for children's well-being. Just last year, UCL produced a report called Nature Nurtures Children that looked at 450 primary school children and the effects of Wildlife Trust led activities on their well-being. It's one of the largest studies into the effects of outdoor learning on children's well-being and views about nature. And overall, the research revealed that children's well-being increased after they had spent time connecting with nature. And the children also gained educational benefits as well as wider personal and social benefits. I'll give you some statistics that will blow your mind, I think. 90% of this of this children felt they learned something new about the natural world. That's perhaps not so surprising. 79% felt that their experience could help their schoolwork. And after the activities, 84% of children felt that they were capable of doing new things when they tried. In other words, just more confident in, in uh, other classes. 79% of the children reported feeling more confident in themselves, not just in schoolwork. 81%, this is an amazing one, agreed that they had better relationships with their teachers. And 79% reported better relationships with their classmates. So 
just to finish, I want to ask yourself this question. Surely we should all accept, surely our politicians should recognise that embedding nature-based play and learning in our education system is critical. Surely all education settings should teach the future and address the twin crises of climate change and wildlife loss. And I would, I would question, surely no one would argue about that. Surely no one would argue that they shouldn't be doing those things, that they shouldn't teach the future. They shouldn't try and address the twin crises of climate change and wildlife loss. And therefore, you have to ask, why isn't it that we haven't got nature-based play and learning properly embedded in our education system? Why is it only now we're looking at developing a GCSE in natural history? We have a lot of catching up to do if we're really going to make sure that we make sure our children are uh, fit and uh, ready to uh, deal with the challenges they're going to face in the 21st century and that we really provide them we really provide them with an education that's going to set them up for the future rather than the past thank you wonderful thank you so much craig and uh, yeah round of applause in whichever way you uh, prefer the recording welcome back those joining us in the recording as well um we're going to move um on from the breakout rooms into our q a with the speakers now so um i hope that you enjoyed your discussions and connections with each other and i'm going to invite my colleague roger um to uh, share maybe a first few questions for our speakers maxwell juliet and craig so over to you roger you're you're just yeah there you go hi hi flo Lots and lots of questions tonight, which is really, really wonderful. Um, the first bunch, the whole series, uh, really for Maxwell, I think, about inclusivity. Sarah from Nature Connect CIC asked, I'm very interested to see how we can make sure our Nature Connection business feels inclusive and accessible. What advice could you give us, please? Jocelyn asked, how can we best work to engage BME communities in Nature Connection? And Andy asked, have you any findings regarding the long-term impacts from your walking groups in terms of well-being or accessing and being in nature? So two questions, one about really about inclusivity and, and the other about long-term impacts of, in terms of well-being and accessing nature. Great, thanks Roger. Over to you Maxwell then on those questions. I think you just need to unmute yourself. Yes, I've unmuted myself, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, I suppose, um, if you want to look at the whole um, environmental, uh, what they call it, um, history, um, uh, is steeped in issue of inequality uh, and in inequity. Um, and so basically trying to change that narrative is, a, is, is, quite, a, is quite a difficult one. Um, because where, where green is white, uh, then obviously, uh, issues of environmental injustice persist. Um, obviously, if you want to look at the whole issue of the environmental um, landscape in the UK, it's always white, not green, um, um, using that metaphorically speaking. Uh, and so to promote inclusivity in, in, in the natural world, we have to uh, see how we can uh, redefine the whole issue or change that notion of green space being white-led. Um, and what do I mean by that uh, is in terms of trying to identify individuals from, you know, from the any communities who have got, you know, um, you know um, knowledge about nature back home, or probably have been born here and, you know, have had experience about nature and that kind of thing, um, and get them involved in all kinds of um, things that we do. Um, because, I mean, the environmental field is quite a privileged area, quite a niche area. Uh, and so you don't see black people there in, as role models. And uh, so if you have that kind of, um, what you call it, a situation, what do you expect? You create a situation where people feel they are not part of something. If you look at the NHS, you want to look at uh, education, you have a lot of minorities there, but in the environmental field, you hardly find them there. Um, and um, I mean, in the breakout room, I was talking to Gil, I said, um, you know, when you talk about nature, when you ask people about nature in, in the West, they tend to say nature, it's the green spaces outside there and the trees. Meanwhile, nature is exactly you, the human being, because we're all part of nature and we call it biocentrism. But in the West, it's anthropogenism, 
where people think they are above nature, and that's why we have the problem we have in the West. Because people think they know too much, they know, they know everything about nature, and they control nature, and they dictate to nature. And, and so we, instead of working with nature, we work against nature. And so in terms of promoting inclusivity, it's a challenge in communities that have historically been marginalized through systematic racism and, uh, and, or, uh, and uh, uh, lack of inclusion. So what we do is trying to break that narrative in terms of getting people out there to promote access to green spaces, to be involved in the whole environment for their health and well-being. Because I mean, the COVID pandemic have just demonstrated that those who really suffer disproportionately are people from DME communities. And so, and the lockdown really from the survey we did, we found that people, DME people are now going out to green spaces because they found they have enough time. They, didn't, they weren't going because they didn't have time. They have, they have to survive on a daily basis. Time is so crucial, so important in people's lives. And people are privileged, take it for granted. Okay? So these are some of the issues. And going back to the long-term impact, again, is to do with health and well-being. Groups we work with are benefiting from, you know, um, uh, having access to green spaces. Like the working group, the black men working group, you know, most people, most men, middle-aged men have suffered from prostate cancer, mental health problems and all those kind of things. This and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, vitamin D deficiency is quite a big issue in, 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 in you know, in black communities. But we are, we are tropical beings, we are not temperate beings, and so we need more vitamin D. And all these issues are not taken up seriously. And so getting that exposure and opportunity to spaces is so important for people's well-being. That has created, it's beginning to create an impact, you know, on the communities we work with. People are beginning to understand. But like again, as I've always said, nature is privilege. You know, if you are not privileged, if you if you don't have enough money and you can pay your bills and be happy, then you, you won't have time for leisure and recreation. And people who came from developing countries, it's a different ballgame. Over there, people's livelihood is linked to nature. And so we call it what? Preservation. Whereas here is conservation for leisure. So we have to look at how we work with groups that we want to introduce to green spaces and to look at the socioeconomic issues that, that prevent people from accessing the, these green spaces that we think, you know, it's normal that if I'm doing it or if I have access to why aren't others doing it, it's not that way. Thanks. Thanks so much, Maxwell. That's really, really helpful. And uh, I know that someone asked um, in the chat box whether we could share um, your slides because there was so much useful information. Um, so if it's okay with you, we can share the, the slides that you shared with um, participants of this call to have um, some of the great uh, information that you've shared. Um, so um, I'll hand back to Roger for next round of questions. And just to say, we're, we're um, going to come up against time a little bit, I think, this evening. So we're going to have maybe have time for two more rounds, Roger. So this one and the next one, just so you know. Brilliant. Okay. Well, funny enough, the, the questions tend to group uh, slow, which is really quite convenient. And the next one's really for anybody. And, it's, and I think there's obviously a lot of parents around because they're both around, the two people asked around apprenticeships are there any remote apprenticeships for 17 year olds on this theme nature and well-being and that was julie from devon uh, and lisa asked for my 15 year old daughter she really wants to work in environmental conservation and wants to ask you if you had any advice uh, to how to follow this as a career path great thank you so um craig or julia or maxwell would anyone like to come in on that I'm, I'm happy to kick off on that. Um, I, I do think volunteering is a great way to get into uh, this area as a career. Um, I mean, I first started as a volunteer or as an activist, if you like, um, and uh, campaigning locally close to where I lived about issues. And that's how I, you know, that was essential the first time I went for a paid job in this area. So uh, that's very, very important. And I would recommend to anyone to just get involved in volunteering, even if you're only doing you know, a couple of hours a week at the weekend uh, in your interested area, or whether you're just sort of trying to run a local campaign in, in the evenings or something. That is essential when you're trying to get involved and, and get a job in this kind of sector. Um, there was a question there about apprenticeships and uh, particularly remote apprenticeships. I mean, obviously, um, it's worth saying that COVID has caused real challenges for organisations that uh, were dependent and had, had a lot of volunteers working together physically. Um, it's taken quite a while for 
wildlife trust for example to work out how we can adapt a lot of our volunteering to bring volunteers back safely but that is happening now which is good so don't be put off on that um, uh, so it, we are starting to see volunteers come back and, and get involved in that work again though what i would say i mean the sort of conversation i've started having uh, with colleagues at the wildlife trust is that a, a lot of the sort of traditional nature organizations have a model of volunteering which is about you know scrub bashing or clearing ditches or whatever and that's historically been what people have done and there's always going to be a bit of a need for that but actually i think we need to go through a bit of a shift of if you like from volunteering to activism you know it's great to have uh, it's great to have people getting involved locally and clearing ditches for us we were always going to need a bit of that but actually the more people that want to get involved with the wildlife trusts and all come together and organize to campaign to get their local authorities to stop using pesticides actually that might deliver an even bigger impact for nature so volunteering uh, through to activism i see is a spectrum really rather than one or the other and, uh, and i think you know, when we face an emergency we're going to have to move more towards the activism end thanks Just, um, yeah and juliet yeah, to add into that yeah I, I completely agree with everything that craig has just said we did a bit of work last year with the i will for nature campaign which I think is well worth looking at if you're a young person. And they um, particularly were looking at volunteering opportunities for young people in the environment, but they've also looked at volunteering for young people within health. Um, and they have got some really interesting role models of young people who've taken up, exactly as Craig said, um, volunteering roles in terms of activism. So have a look at the iWorld campaign. It's coming to the end of this year, but they're looking for organisations who are going to carry it on. But um, that campaign has encouraged all sorts of organisations to embrace young people um, and include them in their work, give them opportunities, also really encourage this um, a leadership role for young people in volunteering, particularly around the environment. Have a look at that. Great, thank you, Julia. You were cutting out there a little bit at the end, but um, I know that Tracy's um, added the link helpfully to the I Will campaign you were mentioning in the mm. chat box so people can find out more about it. Um, and Maxwell, would you like to add anything on this question before we move on? No, I mean, if I answer the question, really, that's fine. Great, okay. Um, so Roger, last round of questions. Oh. Questions about environmental policy, really, and apologies to the, those other people who didn't get their questions asked. Um, Catherine asks, how could, and this is very important for me as a, as a non-driver, how can public transport providers help reduce uh, environmental impact by promoting access to nature? Is there any examples of this that maybe the, 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 the panelists would, could talk about? And finally, a very topical one from Gabriella about the increased use of PPE and hand sanitizers following people everywhere. Is this having an impact on wildlife and how can we prevent that from coming into contact with the natural world? Great, thank you. So around public transport and around kind of the current context of COVID in terms of like the things it's that are needed. and masks, I guess, as well. Yeah. Um, so Craig, I see you nodding. Would you like to come in on those first? Yeah, there's emerging evidence. I mean, it's not surprising really, is it? That, but with the huge uh, increase in the amount of PPE being used and disposable one-use PPE in particular, that is that that is now being found in increasing amounts in the marine environment uh, and it's a real problem it's a real concern i mean uh, it's difficult to see immediately what we do about it because it, it's not i was going to suggest you don't start you stop using ppe but um you know just at the moment where we were perhaps starting to make, get a bit of cut to around single-use plastics it's extraordinarily sad that then you have this uh, uh you know that this aspect of uh, and <laughs> yet another appalling aspect on top of the appalling pandemic. Um, so it's a problem. And I think, you know, we clearly need to see some innovation in this area and trying to uh, solve it. Um, the other thing that we should, uh, shouldn't forget in all of this though, because we haven't really talked about it tonight, is we shouldn't forget that actually the pandemic itself is a symptom of the breakdown of the relationship between humans and the environment and humans and nature. You know, 20, 30 years ago, scientists were warning that if we continue to fragment wildlife habitat around the world, particularly in the tropics, if we uh, if we actually ha didn't stop the wildlife trade, 
if we had our uh, the world connected through air travel, then it was going to make the emergence of deadly pandemics all the more likely. And of course, we have seen the frequency of those pandemics increasing over the last few decades with SARS, with Ebola and so on. And now we've got COVID. And I, I hate to tell you this, COVID will not be the last either. Um, we absolutely need to take this as a wake up call to restore our relationship with nature. And, you know, the, the kind of issues we're talking about are one thing uh, tonight are one thing. But more generally, if we don't turn this around, if we don't actually restore nature and 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 turn uh, take these declines in nature around the world and bend the curve to be in the opposite direction and start seeing an in, a b increase in the abundance of nature and filling in the gaps between habitat rather than just slowing the decline we're going to get more and more and more of these kind of problems so this is really urgent we've got to turn it around and it's it's there's a danger that it's not in the news media enough actually the connection between and the cause of covid in the first place being actually the assault on the natural world yeah thank you so much Prey. really powerful point well made um and um, maxwell and or juliet would you like to add anything on those questions that have been raised around public transport access to nature um and or the ppe issue and covid more generally well um i suppose um Again, the problem um, in the West is to do with the commodification of nature. It's how nature has been commodified um, into something else. Um, and so that has led to the crisis that we are facing called the Anthropocene. Uh, and basically where people are so anthropogenic enough to think they are above nature, and therefore they will have to control nature. These are the crises we're gonna face. We have what we call ecological anxiety, which is sweeping across the world now in most places where people are worried about what's going to happen. But the issue with government policy is that it's only it's preached, they converted, they already converted. The people who really out there who don't know what's going on in government policy have no access. The media doesn't reach these people. So if you're talking about public transport, a cut down emissions, you're talking about the scourge of PPEs being swept into into uh, water streams and then find a way into oceans and those kind of things. How can you address these issues when only a privileged few think they have the power to di dictate or decide what is right for every human being? We have to bring everybody on board. There's the need to change that narrative that nature is, we are all part of nature and we should be doing things to address that issue of privilege and issue of dominance of, of our nature. So we can't talk about cutting greenhouse emissions when we are de deliberately creating the problem because of our lifestyles and expecting things to, to, to be solved. Because man by nature is part of nature. I call it biocentrism. But where we are more anthropogenic in our lifestyles as it's always been, then obviously it's going to lead to our own demise. So to me, I think, you know, uh, we are living on the edge um, and I don't see the way out of this crisis. Um, I mean, the COVID is not going to be the last one. Um, I think um, we are in for a long run. Very long run. Yeah. Sobering words from the panel. Um, but indeed, I do think I completely agree with what's been shared in the sense that it's very important for us to come together and um, find spaces together to acknowledge these issues and then look at you know, powerful projects that are doing things to tackle them. And like Craig has mentioned, you know, activism is going to be increasingly needed to kind of address the, the range of issues that we're facing. So it's really important to come together in these spaces and learn from um, people that are doing work like Juliet Maxwell and Craig. Um, Juliet, would you like to add anything before we move to a close? I've been desperate, desperately trying to um, paste in a link from a paper that was developed by uh, um, Itbed on the role of um, deforestation and uh, the way in which we're encroaching on nature and, and the relationship with pandemics. Um, but maybe we can share something afterwards if, if people, it, it was, it's also, it's been um, reproduced in nature, I think, so we can find it for people, but I'll find that link. But I think really some of this is also about modeling good behavior as well you know what what becomes socially acceptable and the way in which we respond to this pandemic um particularly about how we deal with ppe and, and making sure that um 
we are ourselves being responsible, but also that we are encouraging um, the systems around us to be responsible in responding to this crisis is really important. Um, and that's what we can do at the moment. But, you know, as people have said, this may not be the only time we have to deal with this. So we might as well find the best way of dealing with it now. But, I, you know, I think most people want to do the right thing, don't they? Most people generally are trying to do the best they can do um, in the lives that they lead. And that's that's and we have seen some I think the other thing to remember at this crisis has also seen some extraordinarily positive things come out of it as well, and particularly in the way that people have supported each other. Um, and I think if we can mobilize to support each other at a time like this, then that will we need to hang on to that and think about making the most of that in taking us um, forward to face a future. Yeah. For sure. Thank you so much, um, Julia, and thank you, uh, Maxwell and Craig as well, for um, all that you've shared this evening. It's been a really inspiring and, yeah, and grounding evening as well in terms of all of the issues surrounding kind of community well-being and connection to nature. Um, so we're just, um, yeah, we've just got um, two, two or Few, a few minutes left together and what we would this is actually the final in a series of events being run by the network of well-being and eden project communities and we would love to con continue these types of discussions and what really helps is just to um hear your guys uh feedback on on how you found these types of events so we're just um very briefly going to share a poll to kind of draw the event to a close it's a very brief one but just um asking you a few questions on how your experience has been of this event and if you've been to other events in this series we've been running so um the first question is based on your experience today on a scale of 1 to 10 how likely are you to recommend these types of calls um, this and um, the second question is this event has helped me to um, potentially learn more connect feel inspired um, to connect more with nature or take action to improve your community and then the third is have you attended any of the other um, events in this series and um, we're just asking um, yeah asking these questions to help inform what offering further of these types of spaces so if you just take a few seconds to fill that out that would be very much appreciated and then i'm going to close um the poll in just a few seconds and then we're, we're going to close the evening by um just sharing a few other events that we're both the network for well-being and eden project communities are offering so i've closed the poll just now thanks very much for taking part if you did um, so we haven't got so much time to go into detail about other events coming up but i'm just going to put into the chat box some events that will hopefully be of interest to you guys um, one is a kind of listening space being run particularly around this topic of kind of rewilding and nature space. Um, and then also on this topic, um, Resurgence, who's a kind of uh, a organization that we're friends with at the Network of Wellbeing is running a talk uh, on Gaia, the living earth on the 13th of October, which we'd recommend checking out. And then our next Network of Wellbeing webinar will be on wellbeing women and leadership on the 27th of October. So those are just some links to further things um, that you might want to check out. And I will hand over to Tracy at Eden Project Communities just to say a final word about any announcements from their side before we fully close. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your generosity and your time and your spirit in joining this conversation this evening. I've just uh, posted in the chat, so Eden Communities, we um, endeavour to connect people to each other and the living world. We've got a virtual community course on for people who are working in community activism, want to get involved in their community. Um, that's over five weeks if anybody's interested. But we're also looking for two new team members. So if anybody wants to help us connect people to each other, um, do have a look at that and share it. Um, because um, we like good people in our team. They made an exception for me. They said she's all right. No. Um, so, um, but I have really enjoyed these three sessions. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to give us feedback or if there's any topics you'd like to see covered, do let us know um, and we'll do our best. But thank you so much for 
everybody listening and enthusiasm and engagement they've been really inspirational for me and i hope they've at least helped you think or air a view or a voice thank you so much tracy and um just to close um we love to share a screenshot of the this event so that people that have been there can kind of share it on social media so if you are happy to be in the screenshot i say i see lisa happily waving already which is wonderful great please wave or smile or whatever you prefer to do in, in screenshots and uh if you don't want to be in it feel free to turn your camera off thank you so much guys um, we'll follow up with an email with the recording link and with all of the um, links from the speakers that have been mentioned. Um, but thanks so much again to our speakers this evening, Maxwell, Juliet, Craig. Thanks so much for all you've shared. And thanks for everyone um, involved in this series. And take care, everyone. Bye. I'll